Welcome to The Free Will Show, a podcast that provides a beginner-friendly introduction to free will while also exploring cutting-edge developments on the topic. I'm Taylor Sear. And I'm Matt Plummer. This is our Season 2 Q&A episode. Listeners have been sending in questions about free will and determinism, and today we will be discussing those questions, answering those questions. That's right. Uh, We're going to start with probably our most important question, and I'm excited to ask it because I want Matt to answer it. The question we got from a listener is, Matt, how do you grow such a majestic beard? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, it's uh, really difficult. Um, Takes a lot of patience and grooming. I don't know. Uh, I have to admit that it is no longer quite as majestic because it's so hot where I am. (laughs) <laughs> um, once it gets into the nineties consistently, then the beard gets much shorter and my wife is happier. <laughs> she doesn't like the long beard. Well, yeah, no, she doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Enough about your beard. Um, let's talk about free will. All right. So. We had a lot of questions on semantics and terminology and the kinds of words that we use when we discuss free will. So here's one that has to do with terminology. Um, Do libertarians think that we have contra-causal powers? What is indeterministic causation? So I guess this is two questions in one. Let's talk about the first one first. What what are contra-causal powers? Yeah, that's a good question. I think... A lot of people, when they hear, well, that libertarians think free will is incompatible with determinism, and yet that we have free will, they think, well, if determinism doesn't obtain, if it, determinism isn't true, then how could we cause our decisions or our actions? It seems like the kind of powers we would need to have if we had libertarian free will would be something outside of the causal order of the universe. Mm-hmm. Um so I think that's what a lot of people have in mind when they talk about contra-causal powers. It's something like, I don't know, opposed to the normal causal chain of events. Um, yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I I wonder, too, if it's – I think the, the way to think about it is is right along those lines. Like the there's like the normal natural cause and, ef- and effect um, relationships. Mm-hmm. in the natural world with the natural, I keep saying this word natural, like natural uh, laws. Um, yeah. So that the contra-causal power is somehow able to go against those natural laws. So right. it, it, the natural laws in the past would in, you know, determine some effect, and then the free will kind of breaks into that cause and effect relationship. Right. It's almost... Like it requires something supernatural. Yeah, I, I was going to say that because I kept saying natural, yeah. and I think that was setting up nicely. Like, <laughs> that, does this mean that libertarians have to have something supernatural in order to right. to have free will? Right. I guess given what we've given the types of libertarian views we've talked about in season two here, um, it didn't seem like any of the views required anything like supernatural powers <laughs> for yeah. free will. Yeah, surprisingly enough, nobody mentioned anything <laughs> supernatural in this season. I mean, we probably yeah. could go out and find somebody to interview that requires supernatural powers to have free will. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, so what about indeterministic causation? Yeah, I think this time. is a helpful question because, yeah, if we're if libertarians don't think we need to be some, some kind of supernatural agents in order to have free will, like, well, what what is indeterministic causation? You know, on some views, the non-causal view that we talked about, we need some kind of uncaused events in order to have free will. But on the the more popular views, the event causal and agent causal views, indeterministic causation is just probabilistic causation. So it's not like some some kind of causal power that's outside of the natural order. It's within the natural order. It's just not uh, it's it's not the case that all causes determine their effects or uh, there's not necessarily uh, well, there's not a necessary connection between cause and effect, at least in all cases. So whether it's the events involving the agent, like you know, an agent's having reasons for performing a certain action, or whether it's 
the agent themselves, if we're talking about the agent causal view that's doing the, the causal work on these causal views, uh, uh, indeterministic causal connection just means that the cause doesn't guarantee or necessitate the effect, but there is still a causal relation there. Yeah, there's, there's, we could probably come up with lots of examples from science or just regular type stuff. Um, the, the one that always comes to mind for me is Geiger counters. Mm -hmm. So Geiger counters are, well, let me back up a little bit. Most of the time in physics, when people talk about indeterministic causation, they want to, they want to mention something subatomic. Um, like I've seen people talk about like the location of electrons or something like that, mm -hmm. but it's hard to see how that helps in the, the larger macro, do we call it the macro physical world? Is that the right word? Sure. I'm not a physicist. <laughs> um, how that, how those subatomic particles that involve indeterministic causation, how that kind of percolates up into the ordinary world of bigger objects. But Geiger right. counters are an example of how that works, at least in one case, where the, the particles that <laughs> I keep talking, if I keep talking, I'm going to out myself as not knowing enough about this. <laughs> There's some kind of subatomic particle that is emitted <laughs> that the Geiger counter picks up and it's not determined. So there's right. indeterministic causation there that, that comes up from the micro physical world into the macro physical world. So if there's an example of that in one case, oh. then maybe there's examples of that in other cases too. And maybe yeah. agents making decisions is another example of that. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, I think uh, it'd be worth having more episodes on free will and science and talking to some scientists. Hopefully we'll yeah. get to that down the line on the podcast. Yes, that's a yeah. great idea. Get somebody who actually <laughs> knows what they're talking about to talk about physics. That's right. Yeah. I'll ask the next question. I'm beginning to think that much of this debate, the problem of free will, is semantics. It seems that the common understanding of free will is shared by everyone, but philosophers just use different labels and terms. The average person believes they're able to make free choices. They understand that if choices are forced, they're not free. What do you make of that question, Matt? Yeah, I think this is a great question, and I don't think it's new. I think this is a really old part of the debate um, that people have been using different terms or you, people have been using the same term to refer to different things. Um, and there's a lot of confusion and talking past one another. Uh, so like in the early modern philosophy, there were actually two, two terms that came out of that literature to talk about these different kinds of things, the liberty of spontaneity and the liberty of indifference. Maybe it would be helpful to bring that kind of terminology back. I don't know. I guess that's one of the reasons. So if, if you've listened to our podcast at all, you've, you've noticed at the very beginning, we always ask people, what do you mean by free will? Cause that's mm -hmm. at least, at least philosophers are good at one thing. We're good at like clarifying the terms of the debate, or at least we should be. Right. Um, to ask people what well, what are you even talking about um yeah yeah so what do you think yeah i agree with what you said and i, I like the question I, it's tricky because even just among philosophers who work on free will people have different views about how we should think of the semantics yeah. so someone like peter van Inwagen, who we interviewed thinks free will is a is a term of art you can as a philosopher stipulate what you mean by it it doesn't really you know Map, map on to something out there in the world that everyone is calling free will. Whereas others use the term free will as, um, as uh, they sort of define it by its role, its connection to moral responsibility. Yeah. So, so yeah, free will is the kind of control necessary for moral responsibility. Um, no matter which way you go though, I think, yeah, someone who's an incompatibilist might say, we don't have free will if determinism is true. And a, someone who says they're a compatibilist might say, oh, we do have free will if determinism is true. And it could, be, it could be the case that they mean different things by free will. And so they're engaged in a merely verbal dispute where they're not really 
disagreeing substantively. They're just using the terms differently. And I think that's something we have to watch out for, which, as you said, Matt, that's why we ask each person that we interview at the beginning, what do you mean by these terms? Let's make sure we're not talking past each other. But once we get clear on the terms, it's, I think it is clear that people do uh, disagree about whether free will is compatible with determinism, kind mm-hmm. of freedoms necessary for moral responsibility. Yeah, you, uh, you hear people sometimes come up with, with an objection to compatibilism as, oh, well, that's not really free will. Um, mm-hmm. And so I want, th- this, this idea behind this question is probably behind that objection as well. Like, this is not real free will. Yeah. This is something else. Right. Yeah, I think, though, even still, that would be a sign that there is a substantive debate here. It's not just that people are using the terms differently. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, there's another question that's closely related related to this one. Libertarians understand determinism and compatibilism, some think that they are one and the same, and therefore they feel confident to reject these views and embrace libertarianism. Compatibilists understand libertarianism and some form of determinism, and therefore they feel confident to reject this view and embrace compatibilism. But when asked to give positive definitions for each of their views, they sound very similar. For example, both libertarians and compatibilists believe in free will, cause and effect, some alternative possibilities, um, non-coercion, choices based on desires, and so on. So what do you make of this question? This is this is probably good to talk more about the terminology. Yeah, I think at the heart, this is very similar to the previous question. I think there is a substantive disagreement, um, even though there's going to be some shared points of view between, say, libertarians and compatibilists, because they, they both believe that we have free will. But yeah, at the beginning of the question, this point about how sometimes determinism and compatibilism are used interchangeably, I think that's... Um, important to flag, because you could be a determinist, someone who thinks determinism is true, and be either a compatibilist or an incompatibilist. Um, Similarly, you could be a compatibilist and you could say, well, it turns out that our world isn't uh, deterministic. Um, So those are not interchangeable, even though there was a time, this was really common, the rise of modern science in the modern period, that it was common to think, well, determinism is true. And so if we, if we're going to have free will, it's going to have to be a compatibilist form of free will. And so for a lot, for a long while, uh, compatibilists were just called soft determinists because they were the determinists who didn't think that that, uh, determinism took away our free will. Were, yeah. 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 I was hoping you would say it's soft determinist. Cause if you didn't say it, I was going to say it. <laughs> uh, we could contrast it with uh, hard, hard determinists were the yeah. free will skeptics who were skeptics because they thought determinism took away free will. Yeah. So I think that's a good distinction to make between soft determinism and hard determinism. Um, th- part of the problem is there are so many different views. And when we label the views, we're not, uh, it goes back to the last question. We're not always meaning the same thing with the terms. Yeah. Um, so if we're, if we're labeling the views with regards to determinism, that's one way of doing it with soft determinism and hard determinism. Sometimes we label the views with respect to compatibilism and not whether or not determinism is true or false, but whether or not free will is compatible with determinism. So you have hard incompatibilists who think that free will is incompatible with determinism and, and nobody's got free will. <laughs> right. Um, so yeah, it gets confusing yeah. and more more of a reason to make sure that we are clarifying exactly what we mean when we have a discussion with somebody or um, yeah. read something. Certainly in the recent philosophical literature on free will, determinist has kind of gone out of fashion. No one really identifies as a determinist anymore. So it would be helpful to get rid of the soft determinism, hard determinism categories just because, well... As you mentioned earlier that a lot of physicists think there is indeterminacy in at least the microphysical level, but maybe even at the macrophysical level, there are deterministic interpretations of, say, quantum mechanics. So there is some debate about whether our world is deterministic or not, but the majority of uh, physicists are indeterminist. So it's probably better just to focus, especially as philosophers, just to focus on the compatibility question and the other issues that that 
raises rather than worrying about whether our world's deterministic or not. Yeah, it's probably also worth mentioning that just because one is a compatibilist doesn't mean that that person believes that determinism is true. So you can yep. be a compatibilist and think that indeterminism is true. Um, but you just think that free will is compatible with both. If you think that we have free will, right. you can think that free will is compatible with both determinism and indeterminism. So you can be yeah. kind of like a, a uh, what's the word? I'm looking super for? compatible. Yes, I was going to, I almost said that's, super that's, compatible. That's Manuel Vargas' term. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Since we've had Vargas on the show, I figured I'd use his term. Yeah, that's a good term. I was thinking of being more ecumenical. That's the word I was thinking of. Yes. So they yep. can they can have it both ways. <laughs> There's one article where uh, John Fisher admits to being a uh, super compatibilist, and he says it's very funny. He says he doesn't wear a cape or anything, but he is a super <laughs> right, right, yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. The the advantage of a view like that is your view of free will doesn't depend on what science tells us about the nature of the world, like that we can have free will re regardless of whether determinism is true, which is kind of yeah. nice. That is something, since I mentioned Fisher, that's something he's mentioned in a lot of his published work that his view is resilient to the deliverances of the cosmologists and physicists, because even if they were to find out that determinism is the best interpretation of quantum mechanics is deterministic, you know, whereas a libertarian would have to, you know, give up their view of ourselves as free or, you know, if it was Van Inwagen, he would become a compatibilist. Right? Uh, John Fisher is just already a compatibilist. He doesn't, yeah. he, his view is resilient. So yeah, sometimes, right. I mean, there are criticisms of that kind of argument for compatibilism, but that there aren't that many arguments for compatibilism. It's usually, you know, compatibilist trying to reply to arguments for incompatibilism. So, but that is one, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. Do we want to talk about the the second part of this question about the the similarities between libertarians and compatibilists? So we've kind of already mentioned yeah. some of these. They they both believe in free will. Um, at least all of the ones that we've interviewed both believe in cause and effect. Some mm -hmm. believe in alternative possibilities and some don't. So that's right. one place where there might be disagreement because we have uh, some compatibilists believe that alternative possibilities are required and some compatibilists don't. And right. the same is now true for libertarians. There are some libertarians who don't think yeah. that alternative possibilities are required. Yeah, I guess we haven't really talked about that on the show before, maybe early on in season one. But yeah, there are source or sourcehood uh, incompatibilists. Some of them are libertarians. They mm -hmm. think we have free will, even though, um, yeah, the freedom to do otherwise or alternative possibilities aren't necessarily required for free will. Yeah. So and mostly yeah, because of Frankfurt cases, about? right? Yeah. So we've got the we've talked yeah. about Frankfurt cases in season one, and these are the kinds of cases that are supposed to show that alternative possibilities are not necessary for free will or moral responsibility. And so, uh, libertarians and compatibilists have both, at least part, some libertarians and some compatibilists have both taken the the lesson from that to be well, we need to come up with some kind of theory of free will that doesn't require alternative possibilities where right. it's the you being the proper source of your action is what's important rather than whether or not you could have done otherwise. Right. Yeah. And it is very parallel to the, um, the kinds of source compatibilism that we talked about in our semi-compatibilism episode with uh, Michael McKenna. Um, yeah. The idea is we can kind of accept the upshot of the Frankfurt style cases and focus on, uh, what it means to be the appropriate source of our behavior such that we're responsible for it. And this is where the um, source libertarian will differ from a source compatibilist like McKenna. According to source uh, libertarians, the in order for us to be the appropriate sources of our behavior, to be morally responsible, there has to be indeterminacy in the world at some point. Yeah. It can't be that our uh, actions are determined, causally determined by factors beyond our control. Yeah, so and a lot of them are motivated by manipulation arguments like we talked yep. about in season one. Mm -hmm. yeah. I was about to say that. Sorry. So that's all right. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah Dirk Paraboom, who we interviewed, talks about this that there's a yeah. sourcehood condition on free will, and manipulation arguments show that 
determined, or at least he thinks that, or even people who think that his argument is successful think that manipulation arguments show that when the determinism um, rules out you being the proper source of your action because it's sufficiently like manipulation. Right. Yeah, so he himself is a source incompatibilist because he still thinks we don't have free will. But there are source libertarians. Um, Eleanor Stump is a big name that comes to mind. Yeah, and- one of the confusing parts, is, Kevin Tempe's got a really nice book on this, and he makes a distinction between wide and narrow or broad and narrow source incompatibilists. And mm-hmm. <clears throat> I forget which one's which. Maybe you can help me. Um I think that the broad source incompatibilists include alternative possibilities in their requirements. Is that right? I think that's right. It's been so, a while since I've looked at that, but yeah. Yeah. So you have a view that, that requires being the proper source and having alternative possibilities. And then you have a narrower view that only requires being the proper source and alternative right. possibilities is just like evidence that determinism is not true or something like that. Right. Uh, that's a good point because someone like, Robert Kane, who I think we mentioned at the very beginning of this season, very influential on event causal libertarian views like Chris Franklin's. Um, he talks a lot about sourcehood, but he also talks a lot about alternative possibilities, and he kind of brings those two conditions together. So I guess he would be a broad or, or wide yeah. source uh, libertarian. All right. Well, um, one more question kind of about terminology and semantics is this. Uh, can you elaborate on the distinction between luck and chance in the context of your project? Yeah, another good question. So I, I just want to repeat what Al Mealy said about it in our episode with him when this is one other one of those things where we have to, you know, define our terms. And I like the definition of luck as uh, something that involves chance. So it's a, something that's chancy, mm-hmm. but it's also significant to the person. Um so there might be some chancy things that aren't really lucky because they don't matter. Like maybe it's a matter of chance how many blades of grass are in my lawn, but that doesn't matter. Um, right. But something that is significant, like whether I win a million dollars in the lottery would be more mm-hmm. lucky because it's a matter of chance and it's significant. Yeah. I think that's good. There's a lot of, there's a growing literature on like accounts of luck. Yeah. Um, and I think they, they deal with this in slightly different ways, but mm-hmm. what you said seems right to me. And I think that's probably part of most accounts of luck. Yeah. And so in relation to free will, this is one of the, the main objections to libertarianism is that it involves too much luck that these decisions that we make are significant because whether or not we are deserving of praise or blame, depends on the choice that we make. But if the choice that we make is a matter of chance, then this seems to be problematic that whether or not I'm blameworthy for something is a matter of chance. Mm -hmm. That was all I wanted to say about that question. (laughs) All right. Next question. Uh, Arguments for free will or against determinism often center around moral responsibility. And I've always been puzzled as to why similar free will arguments centering around rationality have so rarely been discussed. Yeah, maybe I'll just flag. I don't. I don't know what arguments uh, for free will um, our listener has in mind. But just because someone was arguing for free will wouldn't necessarily mean they were arguing against determinism, unless they're sort of already building incompatibilism into their view. But right. um, in any case, the the question about the diff, like why the focus has been on moral responsibility and not rationality is very interesting. There is a lot of work on free will and rationality Um, that hasn't really come up much in the podcast but there it is there but it's moral responsibility is much more central because as i mentioned earlier a lot of people are just using the term free will to denote the control required for moral responsibility so it's sort of a necessary condition on moral responsibility and i don't think anyone would say I should I shouldn't say I don't think anyone would say for any of you. There's a philosopher that holds it. Very few people would want to say that freedom is required for rationality in the same way that a lot of people think freedom is required for moral responsibility. Because yeah, suppose that you're a you know free will skeptic. Probably you're not going to think that you know there's no you can't make sense of 
rational or irrational thinking anymore just because determinism's taken away our free will or something like that. Yeah. You know, what do you think, man? Yeah, that's right. I I have run across arguments um, that do want to say what you said that they don't want to say. <laughs> but so, so what you said is true. For any of you, well, there is a philosopher this. who defends yes. that view. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I can't remember where it was published or who was the one who wrote it. But there was a it was an argument that tried to show that income that libertarian free will was required for rationality. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I don't remember much of the details of the argument. Just I'm just throwing it out there that there are, there are people who are talking about this. Yeah. Yeah, there are these debates about whether um, I mean, usually it comes up in the context of um, discussions of evolution, but there's also this worry that if de just determinism is true, if there's, you know, a sort of natural causal explanation for everything that happens, what that would mean for our rational capacities. And so I, I could see someone making that kind of move and trying to raise a puzzle there. But yeah, it's, yeah. it's just that that's already pretty contentious and it's not so contentious that we would need a certain kind of control or freedom to be responsible for what we do. So I think that's why the debate has focused around moral responsibility. Yeah. We've got a related question about the connection between free will and moral responsibility, this time about uh, basic dessert. So here's the question about your interview with Greg Caruso. I'm puzzled about the definition of basic dessert responsibility. Specifically, why are contractualist reasons for praise or blame specifically excluded from basic dessert along with consequentialist ones? Given that the main concern seems to be that basic dessert is backward looking, it's easy to see that consequentialist reasons are excluded when the very name consequentialism focuses on looking forward to the consequences of our actions. But I see nothing in contractualism as usually understood in moral philosophy to exclude backward looking elements. Yeah, this is a great question. That's a very very yeah, perceptive like, question. Yeah. Right. And I like the, the, Thinking about this in terms of backward looking and forward looking, this is the way I try to mm -hmm. teach my students to think about this. Um, and at at a certain level, I don't see why not. Like, so there's, um, I just lost my train of thought. Sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Maybe we should say a lot of people, Dirk Paraboom is one of these, Greg Russo following him says the same sort of thing. When they talk about basic dessert, they have in mind being uh, deserving of praise or blame just in virtue of knowingly doing what you did. So in the case mm -hmm. of, you know, blame or punishment, if it's basically deserved, it's because you knowingly did wrong and not because blaming you is going to have some good effect or anything else. There's nothing more basic than just that you knowingly did wrong. Yeah. So certainly consequentialist reasons, which are forward looking are, uh, yeah, they're not basic in that sense. Mm -hmm. Contractualist reasons, I guess it would take us a bit of time to spell out contractualism, but... Well, um, yeah, just yeah, a, a quick gloss, like the it, they are backward looking in a certain sense because we think of, um, we make certain agreements with each other about how we are to behave, whether these are explicit mm -hmm. or implicit or actually even consciously made. Um, right. So because we've got these norms that we've all kind of basic kind of agreed to um, mm -hmm. that happened in the past um, that we blame and praise each other based on it's kind of backward looking, but it's different. Yeah. Um, do you want to say, say a little bit more about the difference? Yeah, I guess I was thinking this is where it seems a little bit more like consequentialism. It's that um, the, the blame that, even if it's deserved in the contractualist framework, the blame for knowingly doing wrong is more ultimately explained by the fact that uh, reasonable, rational people would consent to this kind of treatment for wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. right? That's sort of part of the contractual agreement that we're presumably tacitly accepting, not explicitly or even consciously endorsing. But yeah, yeah it's, it's not as obvious as with the case of consequentialism, but because we're not talking about future consequences, we're talking about what people would reasonably consent to. But it is 
it's that fact that this is what people would consent to that is justifying the uh, the treatment, the blame, not merely the the person's knowingly doing the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. Should we say anything more about this, or just say? No, I think that's good. Okay. This we could go down a rabbit hole with this one. Yeah. All right. So another question that I think is an. We've got so many good questions this time around. Yeah, we've got a lot of great questions. Um, it seems that asking the question whether or not sufficiently advanced AI could, in principle, have free will would really help clarify the meaning of free will employed in various positions. For example, uh, it seems that the garden variety compatibilist might accept that AI could, in principle, have free will, whereas substance dualists probably would not. Does this way of framing things come up in discussions around free will? Uh, yes, it does come up. Uh, although I think, as this listener has pointed out, it would be cool if more people talked about artificial intelligence and free will. Um, yeah, I've, I've thought quite a bit about this. I think for most people, the answer is, yeah, we could in principle accept that AI... Um, could have free will. I mean, the only reason to think not would have to be that you think there's something about us that is maybe uh, non-physical, maybe the that we have an immaterial soul. Our listener referred to substance dualists. If you think there's this immaterial substance, your, your soul or mind, that's distinct from your body, and you think that having that soul is necessary for free will, well, then assuming that we can't imbue artificial intelligences with immaterial souls, like no matter what we do to the, you know, physical stuff, it looks like we couldn't bestow free will on the AI. But I think for a lot of people, and, you know, I, I love using science fiction mm -hmm. to introduce philosophy and, to, you know, have helpful thought experiments in the background, but, you know, classic robot stories, like from Isaac Asimov's Bicentennial Man or um, the case of the Android and Star Trek, the next generation uh, data, he's been around the other Star Trek too, but um, the, the, these works of science fiction explore this very topic. Um, yeah. Are, are these um, artificial intelligences, these robots, androids, are they making decisions freely? Are they persons in the same way that you and I are persons? Um, and I think a lot of people, if, you know, there might be disagreement about, how sophisticated the AI would have to be to meet this threshold for having free will. But I think a lot of people would say it's in principle possible. And that doesn't require compatibilism so long as the um, you know, programming for the AI could involve indeterminacy. It seems like you could build uh, an artificial intelligence that has free will just like we are built <laughs> to have free will if you're libertarian. Yeah. Yeah, I think that was a really nice answer. And the first thing I think of too is is science fiction, and think about yep. the stories um, that involve really advanced robots, and it, when they do good things and when they do bad things, I initially want to react in the same way that I would react to a, a, a normal human being, with yeah. you know feelings of praise and blame or like say that they you know oh they deserved what they got or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting question because uh, AI is advancing so rapidly. This this is a good area for where um, why we need philosophers. Because <laughs> if we if we get to the point, if I don't know if you've watched the YouTube videos of Boston Dynamics robots. Oh yeah, so cool! Like if you haven't watched those, you should <laughs> check them out. Um, I can, like it. It probably won't be long till we have to face this question when we have a really advanced AI um, and they do something wrong and then we, well, what do we do? Yeah. Like, I don't know. Like it, it seems hard to yeah. imagine uh, or excuse me. It doesn't seem hard to imagine <laughs> um, being in this place and having to ans yeah. answer these questions. Right. Yeah, I will say the the sticking point for me, and this is probably true of certain other philosophers too, is the question of consciousness mm -hmm. and artificial intelligence. Because there, there's a, still this very hard problem. It's called the hard problem of consciousness. <laughs> Excellent like, name. How could, yeah, that's right. Thanks, David Chalmers. Uh, there's this big puzzle about how consciousness could arise from 
physical systems. And yeah, there's this question of like how we would know whether an artificial intelligence is conscious. And while there are some people who don't think that there's like a, I don't know, tight connection between free will and consciousness, I think the common view is that if you're not conscious, you don't have the control required for responsibility. So I think that would be a big kind of first preliminary question before getting into the free will stuff. Yeah, that's that's beyond my pay grade. Yeah. I will say there's a new journal called the Journal of Science Fiction and Philosophy, which is open access and people can check it out. And uh, I, I wrote a paper in that journal on free will and artificial intelligence, tying this stuff with uh, tying this with uh, worries about manipulation. So if people want to check out a uh, sci-fi philosophy paper, you can, you can look at that. Nice. Um, yeah. Uh, there's a question about love and free will. And this takes us back to season one, episode one, talking about the significance of free will, why we should care about whether we have it. So our listener says, true love is not possible without free will. And yeah, I think a lot of people, when they start thinking about, um, you know, think about a robot who's not, or an AI that's not very sophisticated, who's just been programmed to have certain responses. Uh, they're, maybe they're conscious, maybe not, but in any case, they seem forced into you know, responding to a person, could you have a genuine loving friendship with that programmed non-free thing? Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people think no. <laughs> yeah. Another way to come at this is to, uh, there, part of this is science fiction, maybe a fantasy of stories of love potions. I think I might've even mentioned this last in the first oh, yeah. season. Um, mm -hmm. to, if, if we imagine a sufficiently strong love potion, um, where we, it's basically a manipulation kind of worry where we manipulate somebody mm -hmm. into loving another person. Um, and the other person found out about it. It seems like that it's going to tarnish the relationship that it won't, it won't be, uh, I think most people will judge that it's not real, genuine love. It's not true love, whatever you want mm -hmm. to define that as. Um, it's something mm -hmm. else there, there might be like really strong feelings of affection, maybe, uh, infatuation. Um, but it seems to diminish the relationship. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And a lot of people think whether you genuinely love someone depends to some extent on your history. If you were to clone me and my clone was to, you know, go hang out with my kids or my wife even if that my clone had all of these pseudo memories of past with, you know, my wife and kids, they wouldn't be genuine. And it, it might be, I think it's intuitive to say that my clone doesn't really love my kids or my wife. Um, yeah. So insofar as you think it like really having a history of a relationship with someone matters, well, you might think it also matters that part of that history is that you've engaged in the relationship freely. It's not something that you are programmed to do or something like that. Yeah, I agree. <laughs> nice. All right. Next question. Can you talk about the political implications of convincing people there is no free will? Um, couldn't having convinced a critical mass of people that there's no alternative in the hands of a malevolent and organized political project lead to bad outcomes for humans and the planet. If we don't have free will, what is the point of democracy voting of any kind or political actions? Um, so there's several questions within one. Let's, let's, uh, let's yeah. take these one at a time. Well, maybe answering the second two will answer the first. I don't know. Which yeah. one do you want to do first? I think we could talk about them all together. You know, having interviewed uh, our, our free will skeptic, Greg Caruso, in uh, episode four, I can imagine some things he would say in response. Yeah, definitely. I think ultimately he would want to say that there are political implications mm -hmm. of adopting free will skepticism, but they're good, <laughs> good implications that a lot of problematic uh, treatment of, say, you know, criminals um, could be improved by giving up the view of ourselves as free and responsible. Yeah, that that's uh, probably a common theme from free will skeptics is that things will improve by getting rid of this uh, concept in our daily practices. Mm -hmm. But there's also some evidence on the other side that 
giving up the view of ourselves as free would lead to bad consequences. Um, there is there there has been some psychological research that shows that that people sometimes act badly when they re, when you convince them that they don't have free will. Yeah. So at least there's there's evidence on both sides for this. Mm -hmm. I will say a lot of people when they they raise this kind of objection about like, you know, they're worried about the breakdown of civilization mm -hmm. or something. Yeah. I think what they're thinking um, that people are convinced of is that like nothing that we do matters that like no matter what we do, the same thing's going to happen. And, you know, free will skeptics don't have to be that kind of, you know, fatalist. They can think, well, we can still deliberate about what to do can still have caring relationships. We don't even have to give up the idea that there are better and worse ways of acting. It's just what we're getting rid of is this idea that we basically deserve praise and blame. So if you're, once you realize that's the, the view of free will skeptics, or at least the typical view, yeah, maybe the worries about political ramifications goes away a little bit. Yeah. All right, we've got a question about a uh, Frankfurt style case. So imagine a Frankfurt style case in which the agent contemplating two courses of action, say one blameworthy and one praiseworthy, chooses to carry out a morally blameworthy act and does so of their own volition. But the observer both knew what the agent was going to do and direct, directly manipulated the circumstances surrounding the agent in order to bring about the desired result without directly manipulating the agent's thoughts or directly forcing their hand. According to semi-compatibilism, would the agent still be morally responsible? Should the agent be punished to the full ex extent if the one carrying out the punishment for the blameworthy action is the observer? Uh, that last question about whether the, uh, the observer or the counterfactual intervener uh, has the standing to carry out the blame and punishment is an interesting and different question from the the first part of this question. But yeah, any initial thoughts? Yeah, um, I I think this is a really interesting case. Um, so in a normal Frankfurt style case, the person or the the uh, the they they call them the counterfactual <laughs> intervener because they don't actually yeah. do anything; they just watch. And so now we've got a case where the counterfactual intervener doesn't just sit back and watch, but they also manipulate circumstances. Um, so this reminds me of a case that you've had in one of your papers that you published. Oh, yeah. I guess I didn't, I didn't thought of that. Uh, yeah. So it, I guess there's one question about what kind of manipulation we have and whether or not it undermines free will because the normal manipulation cases there's like direct involvement of the manipulator into the agent's thoughts or desires or yeah. beliefs um but now we've got a case where the manipulator just manipulates the circumstances um i'm guessing that if determinism is true it doesn't really matter that if the manipulator is sufficiently informed about the nature of the universe and the past and the laws of nature, mm -hmm. um, that they can manipulate circumstances. And if they're sufficiently powerful, then they can do exactly what they need to do in the circumstances to get the aid, the manipulated agent to do exactly what they want. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm guessing that incompatibilists are going to have the intuition that this person is not morally responsible for what they do for the same reason that the manipulated agent whose thoughts are manipulated is not responsible. Yeah. Maybe I might, this might track the source versus leeway incompatibilist distinction. Maybe. Yeah. I guess it, it depends to me on what manipulating circumstances means, because if it's just like, I don't know, affecting the environment in subtle but not really that important ways then I don't, I don't think that this can really do much to the case it kind of to me when i first read it, it seemed like an ordinary frankfurt style case mm -hmm. so yeah i think that semi-compatibilist even it you know unless what's happening is the observer is taking away the agent's options and the agent knows this so they're doing what they're doing because they couldn't have done otherwise 
Like if that's happening, well, then I think the semi-compatibilist should say, no, the agent's not morally responsible. Yeah. But so long as the agent's got the same kind of, you know, point of view as the, or, you know, the agent in the ordinary Frank versus Hell case, I think semi-compatibilist will say, yes, still responsible. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's right. what a semi-compatibilist should say. Yeah. Yeah. Should that's be. what everybody should say. Not <laughs> <laughs> Touche. Showing my cards a little too much. Yeah. Uh, All right. So the next part of this is should the agent be punished to the fullest extent um, if the one carrying out the punishment for the blameworthy action is the observer? I think this is a really interesting question. Um, you could just think about this in, ca- in the terms of any manipulation case. Um, yeah. And imagine that the manipulator is the one who is going to punish the person for doing a blameworthy action. Um, yeah. And the the times where I've heard this brought up before is is um, in cases of like God, God being the manipulator. Yeah. He sets up the universe in a certain way. Um, if determinism is true, then he knows exactly what's going to happen. He sets it up in order that certain things happen. And one of those things happens to be a blameworthy action from a person. And then he punishes that person for the action that they performed that mm-hmm. God knew that they were going to do. Um, yeah, this, it, I, I don't know. We could probably spend like a whole hour just talking about this one question. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe we should at some point, cause there's a growing, you know, set of literature on standing to blame. Yeah whether this kind of involvement makes one not an appropriate blamer. Mm -hmm. But there is this difference. If this is a regular Frankfurt style case, or at least close to one, and all the observer is doing is just monitoring, Mm -hmm. they haven't really intervened to affect things. I I tend to think, yeah, they're they're in a position to blame just as much as anybody else would, right? Just because they watched and they were ready to make sure that the person did the thing. Yeah, if the person's still to blame, then I think, the observer can blame. Yeah. It's going to, it's probably going to depend on the details of the case, of course. Yeah. Uh, But I imagine something similar happens to parents when they're watching their kids do things. (laughs) (laughs) Like sometimes I watch my kids do things and, and I'm ready to intervene if they're going to do something like really dangerous. Um, But if it's not something that, you know, that's going to hurt themselves or someone else, then I just let, let things go sometimes. And I imagine yeah. like them, me observing and I, I could have done something, but they did something wrong. And then I call them out on it. Um, have you, have <laughs> you had a situation like that? Yeah. I, I don't think my kids deserve praise or blame yet. <laughs> yeah. You're <laughs> still uh, pretty young. <laughs> they're pretty young, but I do think there are cases where, and maybe this is just forward looking praise where I'm about to keep my son from doing something wrong. Uh, but, but he does the right thing. And then I, I turn around and praise him for it, even though I was ready to intervene. Yeah. Um, but that's probably for forward-looking forward. reasons. Is that what you were about to yeah. say? Yeah. So that you are yeah. encouraged. But I do think you could have a case like that, though, like a Frankfurt intervener who wants someone to do the right thing, yeah. but they also want them to do it on their own, and yeah. then they, you know, they, they go and they praise them for doing it. Yeah, there, there are... So there's a cottage industry of YouTube videos where people do like setups to see if people will do the right thing. Have you seen these videos where they'll like leave no, a wallet on a bench and then video what happens? And uh, okay. like sometimes people will like look around and try to find the owner of the wallet and they do the right thing. And the the person videoing was ready to intervene. Um, right. Since the person did the right thing on their own, then they won't, hey, good job. You know, you're, you're praiseworthy for that action. Have you seen these videos? Nice. The the funniest no, I haven't. I'm have the funniest that. one is where they uh, sometimes they're they're like pranks, um, <laughs> and they put a bike out in a park to see if someone will steal it. But the okay they've sawed the bike in half and like duct taped it back together, so that if somebody does try to steal it, then the bike falls apart as they're riding it away. <laughs> <laughs> that's great yeah <laughs> all right next question how do you factor incomprehensibility into your thought on free will uh, how ought we to think in light of the fact that we might be trying to find answers to questions that can't be solved hmm. 
That's a good question. You know, I'm one of these philosophers that tends not to want to appeal to mystery or comprehensibility. We talked about this a little bit with Sashebo. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe there is something to be said for a kind of mysterian or incom- in- incomprehensible view of free will. If we have it, we just don't really know how we could have it. Um, I tend not to favor that kind of approach if I think, well, you know, having thought about free will for quite a bit of time, we can kind of make sense of some views. And yeah, I don't know. I don't, I'm not really tempted towards thinking that our having free will is mysterious, but what do you think, man? Uh, I, I actually really like the Mysterium view sometimes. Maybe it's because I'm, I'm like Peter Van Inwagen told us that he gave up on writing about free will because it's just too hard. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So maybe this, this kind of plays into it too. Uh, I, I'm, I'm kind of wishy-washy. Sometimes I think that I've got it all figured out and then I read more and I think more and then I'm like, man, I don't know what I think about free will. Um, yeah. Yeah. Or sometimes I say if I, it depends on what side of the bed I wake up on that if I wake up on the wrong side of the bed, I'm a compatibilist. (laughs) But yeah, it's like part there, there, there is something mysterious about this um, when you think long and hard about all of the factors that are involved in uh, making a decision. Um, yeah. yeah, I don't know what else to say other than that. Yeah, I think in philosophy in general, this kind of question can come up very easily because we realize that philosophy is very hard as a whole. But when someone like Peter Van Inwagen says that free will in particular is just too hard, that's a sign that (laughs) it is a pretty hard problem. Yeah. And it touches on like, we've mentioned this before, it touches on every other area of philosophy. It really is, um, you know, does get into metaphysics and ethics, but also epistemology and lots of other sub you know, branches of philosophy. So that just makes it really hard. Um, yeah, that's a good me, point. That, that's exciting. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. If any, any deep philosophical problem that you've thought about at some point, you've probably run into this problem um, where it gets difficult and there's some kind of mystery involved. The, the truth is probably going to be a lot stranger than we think once we find it out. Yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people feel that way about the debates about consciousness right now, since we alluded to that earlier. Yeah. It's super hard. The one I think of is personal identity. Like this, the problem of personal identity is so hard. Um, And whenever I think that I'm kind of making headway, somebody brings out a counter example and I'm like, oh crap, I don't, I got to go back to the drawing board. (laughs) All right. Well, we have one last question and it's uh maybe one we should have started with but i thought it'd be fun to end with it's about methodology uh here's the question many if not most discussions of free will seem to presuppose the outcome namely that there is such a thing as free will and so we must figure out how such a concept can exist in light of science logic theology etc this seems to be a rather unusual way to go about understanding something we got this question from a scientist from my point of view The first and most important question is whether or not free will exists, independent of the consequences and of our basic intuitions. All questions related to morality or other implications are downstream and should not rightfully enter into deliberations on whether free will is real or illusory. Phrased another way, there are, I think, two questions that should be kept separate. A, does free will exist? B, how could free will exist given what we think we know about the world about logic, about God, et cetera. Yeah, another great question. Maybe yeah. the first question should be the one that we've already talked about is what fr- what is free will? <laughs> yeah. And then we can ask, well, do we have it? Um, right. Yeah, so this should, should we use this to set up what we're going to talk about next season? Um, yeah, I think that's good. Yeah. That, uh, yeah, so... The like, what is free will question, I think is, you know, well, as we've already suggested, philosophers disagree about the right, the right way to answer that. But Mm -hmm. that is kind of, it is a philosophical question. And then looking into whether we have free will is only really possible once we know what it is we're looking for. So I, I think it's a natural, 
it's an it's natural to start with questions about what we mean by free will, what we take it to be, and whether it would be compatible or incompatible with determinism. And so that's why I think a lot of philosophers have treated the question of whether we have free will as um, not secondary in importance, but in terms of you know doing the philosophy, it comes second. Yeah, is that how you see it, Matt, or do you see it differently? Yeah, I I see it in much the same way. Um, or I think about the debate since we've talked about the tight conceptual connection between free will and moral responsibility as we see ourselves as responsible agents, like mm -hmm. our daily interactions with people are filled with praise and blame attributions of what other people do to mm -hmm. us. And, and however you want to cash out what that means, um, if free will is if we're if we're going to say that it is just a kind of control that a person has to have in order to be morally responsible, it's kind of like already out there in the world. Um, and then we can talk about well, perhaps yes, perhaps yeah. <laughs> we have to we have to um, it at least gives us a handle on yeah. the question. Yeah, yeah. And I think that also makes it important that to you know to realize that using our basic intuitions using ethical reasoning is going to be of primary importance, not just the, the tools of science where we're just out there in the world looking at whether we see free will. Yeah. Or you could kind of work backwards. So we see, it, it seems that we're responsible. So what would need to be true of us in order for us to be responsible? Um, and then, right. and then we kind of work backwards and say, well, we got to have X, Y, and Z and let's see if we've got X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. I think that's really good. So I gave well, the teaser yeah. about next season. Just, <laughs> we can go ahead and make the announcement that we are going to be talking about free will and science in the fall. And we've got a list. We're, we're calling it our um, free will draft board. <laughs> 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 Where we're going to be uh, reaching out to people who specialize in philosophy and science to have them on the show and talk about their research. Yeah. So there are lots of questions about free will and science um, from all lots of different scientific disciplines. So there's lots of ways that this could go. It'll partly depend on who we can rope into our podcast. Yeah. 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 There's so many interesting things in the different branches of science, too. So who are there physicists, um, psychologists, neuroscientists, like you name it. There are people mm -hmm. in science who have thought a lot about free will and have pursued this avenue of research yeah and a lot of philosophers you know people who specialize in philosophy and not so much in science but um there are a lot of philosophers who have learned enough science to be able to you know communicate with scientists in all these different disciplines about questions about free will so yeah. it'd be cool to talk to some of them too yeah and some have worked together collaboratively believe it or that's not. right yeah Cool. Well, thank you for tuning in to this season two Q&A episode, and I hope that you'll check out our season three when it comes on uh, free will and science. <laughs>